Projective morphology contributes to the evolution of consciousness. That is its human value. And the discovery of the imaginary is a major step. Given a line and a conic, coplanar, project any point of the line to the intersection of its polar with the given line. Because of the fundamental theorem of pole and polar, this projectivity is an involution. It will move in reciprocal breathing movement if the line carrying it lies inside the conic. The two points it has in common with the conic are the visible double points of the involution. It will be a circling involution if the line carrying it lies outside the conic. The two points it has in common with the conic are the imaginary double points of the involution. We can now generalize. A line meets a coplanar curve of the second order in exactly two points. If the line lies tangent to the curve, the two points coincide. If it lies outside the curve, it meets it in two imaginary points. Ready to polarize? Given a point and a conic, coplanar, project any line of the point to the line connecting its pole with the given point. Because of the fundamental theorem of polar and pole, this projectivity is an involution. It will be a breathing involution if the point carrying it lies outside the conic. The two lines it has in common with the conic are the visible double lines of the involution. It will be a circling involution if the point carrying it lies inside the conic. The two lines it has in, the co in common with the conic are the imaginary double lines of the involution. We can now generalize a point meets a coplanar curve of the second order in exactly two lines. If the point lies on the curve, the two lines coincide. If it lies inside the curve, it meets it in two imaginary lines. The imaginary consists of cycling movement. It can circle in either direction. Von Staudt realized that the two points, or the two lines, pass through the involution in the two possible directions. Think the movements of a conjugated pair as the point or line and its projection chase each other at varying speeds through the range or pencil and you enter the realm of imagination. An imaginary point is represented by a circling involution. It lies in the visible line that carries the involution. This is the only visible line that lies in that imaginary point. An imaginary line is represented by a circling involution. It lies in the visible point that carries the involution. 
This is the only visible point that lies in that imaginary line. This picture also shows that you can connect an imaginary and a visible point by means of an imaginary line or an imaginary and a visible line by means of an imaginary point. As noted at the beginning of this whole series, any two coplanar points meet in exactly one line, and any two coplanar lines meet in exactly one point. And that applies to the imaginary as well. In case you were wondering, an imaginary point, line, or plane is analogous to the imaginary number i. Its circling movement in both directions is analogous to positive and negative i both of which are the square root of negative one. Square roots come in pairs. Bombelli discovered that you can use imaginary numbers to calculate perfectly visible intersections with cubics. With quadratics, the intersections may be a pair of imaginary points, namely, those circling through the involution of pole and polar we just practiced. At the same time, the involution of lines shows a pair of imaginary tangents from a visible point inside the curve. Their tangent points are the imaginary points perspective to them in the polar. How about joining two coplanar imaginary points? Hmm. Pause if you want to try it on your own. The idea is to construct corresponding ranges of both involutions. Cast one of them into a Steiner circle and join projective points to find the center of involution. It has to be inside the Steiner circle, since this is a circling involution. Use this center to project the intersection X of the two involutions. With respect to its perspective and projective images, and the Steiner circle, find the harmonic conjugate of the center of involution. Find the intersections of its polar with the Steiner circle. These give a pair Y and Y double prime in the involution, separating X and X double prime harmonically. Repeat the procedure with the other involution. Now you have a harmonic range of each involution, both proceeding from X. Being harmonic, they are also perspective. The pencil connecting them gives the involution representing the imaginary line connecting the two imaginary points or to be more precise, the two imaginary lines, one circling in each direction, connecting the twice two imaginary points. Of course, you can also connect the imaginary points crosswise in these two imaginary lines. Altogether, the four imaginary points like any four coplanar points, meet in six lines. Twice two imaginary lines, 
plus obviously the two visible lines we've started out with. Pause if you want to polarize that and join two coplanar imaginary lines. Cast one of the involutions into a Steiner circle and join projective lines to find the axis of involution. It has to be outside the Steiner circle since this is a circling involution. Use this axis to project the line X connecting the two involutions. With respect to its perspective and projective images on the Steiner circle, find the harmonic conjugate of the axis of involution. Find the lines joining its pole with the Steiner circle. These give a pair Y and Y double prime in the involution, separating X and X double prime harmonically. Repeat the procedure with the other involution. Now you have a harmonic pencil of each involution with X in common. The range connecting the two harmonic pencils gives the involution representing the imaginary point connecting the two imaginary lines. Or to be more precise, the two imaginary points, one circling in each direction, connecting the twice two imaginary lines. Of course, you can also connect the imaginary lines crosswise in these two imaginary points. Altogether, the four imaginary lines, like any four coplanar lines, meet in six points, twice two imaginary points, plus obviously the two visible points we started out with, circled here in green. The Steiner circle also allows you to locate the point of greatest density in a given involution, about which the points lie closest to their projections. This being a metric notion, you have to construct it metrically, namely by projecting the infinitely distant point. Then you can use the same trick as before, namely a harmonic conjugate and its polar to find a pair within the involution harmonic to the infinitely distant point and its mate, that is, bisected by the center of density. This is the closest pair in the involution, at least in terrestrial terms, and its distance may be called the amplitude of the imaginary points. Note that the center of density is not just the point marked here in red, but the projective pair, the red point and the infinitely distant point. The circling slows simultaneously in both vicinities. But wait, how do you polarize that? After all, there is no angular equivalent of infinitely distant. The greatest possible angular spread is a right angle. But how are you going to find a projective pair at right angles? With your handy multi-purpose Steiner circle, it's a cinch. Just make it a metric circle and set it cleverly in the anchor point of the involution. Connect projective points to find the center of involution. Connect that center with the center of the circle 
and presto, you have the rectangular pair subtended by a diameter. This pair is the axis of density. Now to find another pair harmonic to the axis, that is, bisected by the axis. Obviously the diameter joining the axis pair will lie perpendicular to the line joining the harmonic pair. This is the closest pair in the involution and its spread may be called the amplitude of the imaginary lines. Think these involutions in movement. Each is colored to show that it is a pair in movement. In the circling involution, you can now see that the center of density is a pair, as is the axis of density, here green. This time, the curve shown in gray is not a Steiner circle, it is the conic determining the involutions. Whereas a growth measure collides with itself, coming to a halt in two double points or double lines, a circling measure only slows down like a bird about to alight, hovering, but then ascending again without ever quite touching the earth. Its double points or double lines never precipitate into visible sedentary position, but remain latent within the circling movement. When an exterior line carrying the imaginary points of a curve approaches the curve, the amplitude contracts. When the line reaches the curve, the amplitude collapses, becomes zero, the circling ceases, and the double points incarnate as a visible tangent point. Zero is a multiple of I, and as such, is also an imaginary number. Thus a curve is present not only where it is visible, indeed, it pervades the whole plane with its imaginary currents. It becomes visible only where those movements have come to rest. By the way, the hyperbola traced here by the amplitudes appears in space as a somewhat flattened two-sheet hyperboloid tracing the amplitudes of imaginary ellipses in parallel planes intersecting an ellipsoid externally. For extra credit, feel free to model that in clay or something. Connect corresponding amplitude markers crosswise so that they never condense to visible double points and you have traces of an imaginary ellipse. Its points are not the amplitude markers themselves nor even the involutions they denote but the movements of the conjugated pairs in both directions. Those movements in all the lines of the plane simultaneously constitute the imaginary ellipse. Not the imaginary part of this visible ellipse, which is shown here only for orientation, but its completely imaginary analog And in the polar situation, the spatial version is a cone, here red, opening to the upper left 
and the lower right, marking the amplitude of imaginary planes internally tangent to the ellipsoid. The green line running upper left and lower right is the midline of the cone, and the other green line is its midplane. But we'll stick to two dimensions. When an interior point carrying the imaginary lines of a curve approaches the curve, the amplitude, here red, expands. When the point reaches the curve, the amplitude flattens, becomes infinity. The circling ceases, and the double lines incarnate as a visible tangent. Infinity, this exercise would seem to suggest, is also an imaginary number. The curve becomes visible where the circling of the imaginary pairs has come to rest. The unseen part is richer than the seen. Connect corresponding amplitude markers crosswise so that they never condense to visible double lines and you have traces of an imaginary ellipse. Its lines are not the amplitude markers themselves, nor even the involutions they denote, but the movements of the conjugated pairs in both directions. Those movements in all the points of the plane simultaneously constitute the imaginary ellipse not the imaginary part of this visible ellipse, which is shown here only for orientation, but its completely imaginary analog. The imaginary, though invisible, has visible effects. For instance, Given five points of a conic, three of them visible and the other two imaginary, construct the conic. Call the visible line connecting the two imaginary intersections P for polar and find its pole. The line connecting any two of the visible points gives you a point X in P. Construct X's harmonic conjugate and also its conjugate in the involution. Draw the line connecting these two conjugates. This line is the polar of X and by the fundamental theorem of pole and polar, it lies in the pole of P. Repeat the procedure on another pair of visible points, and you have the pole. The pole and polar let you find a further point of the curve, harmonic to one of the given points. Now any pair in the involution, connected with any harmonic pair in the curve, gives you a further point, or actually two, and that creates new harmonic pairs, and so on. Pause if you want to polarize that on your own. Given five lines of a conic, three of them visible 
and the other two imaginary, construct the conic. Call the visible point connecting the two imaginary tangents P for pole and find its polar. The point connecting any two of the visible lines gives you a line X in P. Construct X's harmonic conjugate and also its conjugate in the involution. Mark the point connecting these two conjugates. This point is the pole of X. And by the fundamental theorem of polar and pole, it lies in the polar of P. Repeat the procedure on another pair of visible lines, and you have the polar. The polar and the pole let you find a further line of the curve, harmonic to one of the given lines. Now any pair in the involution, connected with any harmonic pair in the curve, gives you a further line, or actually two. And that creates new harmonic pairs and so on. Given five points of a conic, one of them visible and four imaginary, find the conic. Call the common point of the two visible lines connecting the pairs of imaginary points, P for pole, and find its polar. Project it in one of the two involutions. But this time, use the given visible point as the perspective point in the Steiner circle. Use the same Steiner circle to project P in the other involution likewise. These two projections meet in the polar. Now connect the two centers of involution to find the double points in the polar, that is, the tangent points from the pole. That makes five visible points, enough for Steiner's pointwise conic construction like this. Ready to polarize? Given five lines of a conic, one of them visible and four imaginary, find the conic. Call the common line of the two visible points connecting the pairs of imaginary lines, P for polar, and find its pole. Project it in one of the two involutions, but this time use the given visible line, here lavender, as the perspective line in the Steiner circle. Use the same Steiner circle to project P in the other involution likewise. These two projections meet in the pole. Now connect the two axes of involution, here gray, to find the double lines in the pole, that is, the tangents from the polar. That makes five visible lines, enough for Steiner's linewise conic construction, like this. If you leave the four imaginary points in their orbits and slide the visible point around, you get a whole pencil of conics, like this, which also happens to be a perspective image of Apollonian circles.
Hmm, not bad for a freehand sketch.